So we're, we're seeking to go ahead and get started here shortly. Uh, my name is Dr. Jay Griffith. I'm a psychiatrist at the VA and am a clinical associate professor in the department. And I'm introducing our grand round speaker for this morning, F. Barton Evans III, PhD. Recently in Grand Rounds Planning Committee, we thought it would be timely to have a talk on interviewing. And I think when you hear Dr. Evans' background, you'll agree he's well positioned to provide unique insights in this area. Currently, he's a clinical psychologist at the Asheville VA, where he's completed over 1,800 disability assessments. His training, he received a uh, B.S. in Psychology, Magna Cum Laude, from Tufts University, a Ph.D. at American University, underwent an internship at the Brentwood VA, and did a postdoc fellowship at Yale University. He currently has an appointment at George Washington University in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. He's published and given over 100 50 presentations nationally and internationally in a wide variety of subjects, including the psychological evaluation, author of two books, one authoritative book on Harry Stack Sullivan, another interestingly on the handbook of forensic Rorschach assessment that he co-authored. He practices the therapeutic assessment, and he describes it in the following way. The therapeutic assessment is a collaborative method combining psychological assessment and psychotherapy in which assessors and clients work together on the joint venture of exploring clients' problems and living. His presentation today is PTSD as a Human Experience Beyond the DSM-5. Please welcome Dr. Evans. Can you hear okay or so good? I'm going to do this. this be, uh, okay. Is this going in and out? Yeah. How about I use the mic? Do you have the mic? People hear me now? Okay, thank you very much. Well, listen, I, uh, th I want to thank you all for uh, the invitation to come over. Um, on such a uh, uh, kind of a dismal day, and uh, hopefully I can warm you up a little bit with some thought about uh, some different ways of thinking about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, uh, first of all, before I go further, I have to give you a disclaimer uh, saying that what I say does not represent the VA or the federal government. Pretty standard disclaimer. And, uh, and a thanks to uh, uh, collaborator uh, Dr. Brian Marks, who I did some presentations with. And uh, so what we're going to do. So I'm going to just kind of run through quickly. How many people do work a lot with PTSD? Okay. So you're probably uh, getting used to or already used to the new DSM-5, uh, which I think is a very nice... Uh... Okay. There we go. No, it's all right. I wonder about, uh, 
How is that? Am I going in and out? That, okay, that sounds good. So basically, um, I'm just going to go very quickly over what the kind of the new definition is. And then what I'm going to try to do is to have us think out of the box a little bit about other ways of thinking about, another way of thinking about PTSD. Um, uh, and uh, so, let, you know, the first question is, what is PTSD? And the way that we often know it, certainly in the VA and practice, we know it as a disorder. Um, and it's a mental disorder. It's part of the DSM-5. Um, these are the basic criteria that we have to look at. Um, <clears throat> we have to have a stressor exposure. Um, and what is nice about the DSM uh, is that it's no longer an anxiety disorder. It's its own category. And there are other diagnoses in this category uh, that I think are, bet are better conceptually understandable in terms of traumatic experience or life adjustment experiences. Um, <clears throat> there's a new refined definition of the stressor criteria. What they had found over time is that there's been a drift in the stressor criteria. And um, so that a lot of things that were included um, in stress as stressors before don't, uh, are not as included as much anymore. Um, and then now they, based on the research, then instead of being three symptom clusters, there are four. Uh, and uh, those, are, those are the four. Uh, the new criteria talks about uh, a much better defined uh, way of thinking about it, including uh, uh, they've included a, uh, a new category for people who are doing um, uh, you know, traumatic experiences like police and rescue folks and things like that is the last one. They're also including learning uh, about uh, a trauma from a close man, uh, family member or a close friend. This, again, uh, you know, further defines the, uh, that criteria. Um, we no longer have criteria t A1. That actually is reemerges as a new symptom in cluster D. And then we have, are, are people pretty familiar with this? Because I'm going to move through it pretty quickly. I'm just going to show it because I don't think it's the most important stuff that we're going to be talking about today. Um, uh, cluster B is essentially unchanged. Uh, cluster C is now basically the avoidance and numbing uh, cluster has been broken down into two separate factors. One is an avoidant factor and the other negative alterations in cognitions and mood associated with trauma. And, uh, and one of the things I want to say about that, just to think about it conceptually, is that the negative alterations pick up more of the kind of symptoms that we see in interpersonal trauma and betrayal traumas. Um, by betrayal trauma, I mean psychological trauma by somebody that's close to you with whom you should be able to expect a kind of a safe relationship, like in child sexual abuse or in domestic partner violence. Okay, and so we have, um, you know, our standard avoidance symptoms, which are, have been broken down into two kinds of things, and we have to have one of those. Uh, the negative mood and alteration, two are required. Um, again, the new one is persistent negative beliefs about oneself and the world. That's a very interesting, that's a kind of intra, introjective, uh, for those of you who are psychodynamically oriented, a kind of a turning of the trauma against the self. And instead of saying, <clears throat> uh, looking at the trauma as something that happened to one, it one often takes and focuses that I'm a bad person because I've undergone the trauma. This is very, very common in interpersonal and betrayal type traumas. Um, blaming oneself, and I'm going to talk about what, what might, why would, why do people do that? Why would you blame yourself if you're traumatized? Um, we see the persistent uh, negative emotions. That's the criteria A2 showing up in this cluster. Uh, marked interest, um, feeling alienated, these are all kind of ones from the old uh, 
DSM-4. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, uh, instead of uh, just in psychic numbing, we're talking about uh, deficits and positive emotions. Um, and then the two kind of ways in which trauma affects our view of ourself and our view of the world. Uh, and I, I think these are, uh, you know, are, are important additions. Um, basically, uh, the old cluster C, now cluster D, is, or actually D and now E, is pretty much the same, except for they've uh, included self-destructive and reckless risk-taking behavior. And that's based on a lot of very good research indicating that people um, sort of re-traumatize themselves or go into dangerous situations with some notion that there may be kind of an addiction to the dopamine rush that people experience in trauma. And you see this a lot. Um, you see this a lot in combat vets. Whoops, uh, that's not what I wanted. There we go. And the, the other thing I'd like to say is no longer is if you're feeling irritated or irritable, is that a symptom now of this last, of cluster E, you actually have to have that in your behavior. And I think that's a nice, um, that's a nice addition as well. Um, so you basically have uh, four symptom clusters that have to be met. You have 16 out of 20 symptoms rather than five out of 17. You can sort of ask the question, is there any real difference between the DSM-4 and the DSM-5 in, in uh, kind of uh, diagnostic accuracy? And what we see is in three studies, it's fairly close. Um, what we see in one study is that the new, uh, the Miller, the second Miller study, there may be some under a diagnosis of PTSD from the old standard, but my, by and large, these are a pretty equivalent diagnoses in terms of incidence. Another good feature, which captures really a, um, an aspect of PTSD in much more severe psychological trauma presentations, which is a dissociative uh, subtype. I mean, this puts a kind of uh, PTSD on the boundary with dissociative disorders, which is where it belongs, because dissociative disorders are pretty much clearly disorders of trauma as well. And we may have, they may have actually kind of put that in that category and have done pretty well. Um, and then, uh, you know, again, it's more likely if you have a dissociative presentation in PTSD, you're likely to endorse a history of uh, sexual abuse or assault. Um, and it, this, again, shares boundaries with dissociative disorders and borderline personality disorder, which I think is, a, again, a good thing because <clears throat> a lot of the research on borderline personality disorder um, indicates early childhood traumatic experience, um, particularly the uh, Herman uh, van der Kolk and, uh, and Perry study that really showed the degree of trauma uh, at some of the three different ages and the three kinds of trauma, the higher that that three by three block fills up, the more likely you are to have a, a borderline personality diagnosis. So when you're getting somebody in, uh, that's dissociative and borderline, you ought to be asking the question, is this a trauma disorder? Um, and are these dissociative disorders and borderline personality disorders more pervasive, deeper implanted kind of adaptations to unremitting childhood abuse. We now have, a, a, instead of anxiety disorder, NOS, which is one of the great catch-all categories, one of the delights of the DSM-5, is that if you're gonna give a, a, an other specified, an NOS type of thing, you have to specify what it is, what you're talking about. So it, it increases diagnostic accuracy. This is really good because this, uh, there's a lot of research on sub-syndromal post-traumatic stress that uh, 
uh, indicates that it's really an impairing disorder. You know, you can think about it, just think about a person who is just pervasively numbing and avoidant in their behavior. They may not be having re-experiencing symptoms, but we know that the course of treatment for those uh, folks is much longer and it's much harder to, to deal with because the more a person is numb and avoidant, the less they're likely to engage in uh, corrective experiences such as psychotherapy and the like. Um, this is a nice diagnosis because it requires exposure to trauma that's similar to PTSD. This gives us a lot more accurate ways of categorizing people that, you know, is with real, the real advantage of the DSM. So we, okay. If you're sufficiently put to sleep with this kind of dry academic presentation so far, I've done what I needed to do, okay? What I'd like to say is that the DSM has an important place particularly in some categories where we're seeing much better definition based on research, but it really doesn't tell the, um, the story of what our human clients are going through. It gives us nice diagnostic accuracy, but it often doesn't give us a way to connect to people in ways that are very important if we're going to be treating them. Um, and so what I'd like to talk about is another way of thinking about PTSD, not so much as a diagnosis, but as a normal adaptation to highly dangerous and overwhelming circumstances. And so what, this is what I call PTSD as a human experience. I borrow this from Harry Stack Sullivan. Anybody familiar with Sullivan? He's kind of gotten lost over the years, yeah. Those of us who are older. Um, <clears throat> Harry Stack Sullivan was a psychiatrist in the 20s, 30s, and 40s who really was a very important um, critic of Freudian psychoanalysis. Sullivan began to think about mental disorder as a disorder of disturbed relationships. And it adds to our understanding of how to approach people. Sullivan had a very famous uh, uh, part of his theory, which he called the one genus hypothesis, which is that we're simply more human than otherwise. And so what he liked to think of is not so much the Kraepelinian uh, differentiation of normal versus abnormal, but looking at people along a, along a spectrum of experience that we all have. We all have psychotic experiences, unless you don't dream. We all have experiences of anxiety. And so what he liked, tried, to, tried, tried to do is look at the commonality in human experience and also looked at the adaptive nature of psychological symptoms. And so what I'd like to point out is that the part of the problem with the DSM is it's, it's necessary but not sufficient. It, uh, there's a problem with a purely diagnostic and dis, uh, disorder approach in that it, uh, it's you know, based on the Kraepelinian model of normal versus abnormal. So we have a normal psychiatrist or psychologist or social worker or counselor dealing with an abnormal patient. And that creates a kind of relationship that may not be the very best one that we might want to have ultimately when we're trying to treat people. Um, I would also like to say, and one of the things I'm going to put forth today, is that PTSD symptoms are befuddling, but clear attempts at trying to adapt to overwhelming life circumstances. I'd also like to think of symptoms not so much as something that exists out there, but as entry points into repair in a relationship so that when we see symptoms and when we kind of redefine them um, in this uh, new way, uh, we'd like to think about them as a way to enter into the person's experience so that we can be of help to them. And that it allows us to help to reframe the trauma narrative from disordered to self-awareness to survival and even growth. And that's eventually what we want. 
you know, somebody who defines themselves, and I'm, I'm sure, how many folks here work in the VA? Okay, so you know, you know, I often meet with veterans, and I say, well, you know, what, uh, you know, what's the problem? He said, well, I'm PTSD. Or sometimes you'll say, I have PTSD. But you hear, or I am OCD. So their symptom picture, the things that we're using as professionals to kind of help us better understand how to help them become actually identity definitional ways of thinking about themselves. They're not thinking about themselves as a person who is struggling with this. But we're always more than our disorder. And we're always more than our anxiety and we're always more than our dysfunction. And so what I'm hoping to do is to give some ideas so that we can really begin to redefine some of these things that we call symptoms as adaptive attempts and that allow us to enter into the narrative that the person has in a very new and hopefully more helpful way. So let's see, what, how can we understand re-experiencing symptoms, which are the intrusive memories, nightmares, flashbacks, traumatic triggers, and feelings of panic or hyper, you know, hyper uh, uh, emotionality. I think that the, fun I, the, the my thought is that the function of re you know, why do we do this? Why, what about us as human beings makes us try, to, why do we bring this stuff over and over again and how come it gets stuck? So. What, is the what might be the function of that? And so my thought about that, is certainly an initial thought, is that we're what we're trying to do is we're trying to comprehend the incomprehensible. One of the things that's powerful about experiencing psychological trauma is the utter meaninglessness of it. You know, when, when we send young men and increasingly young women to war, we send them with an idea that they're you know, protecting our country, uh, protecting freedom, protecting the American way of life. But when they, get into, when they get into combat and they're standing there or crouching or behind something and all of a sudden their buddy has his head blown off, it's a hard thing to try to comprehend in the immediate experience. Okay. What sense does that make? We can go back and say, well, you were fighting for your country and things like that. But in the experience near the actual life as lived aspects of that, it's pretty hard to comprehend. And the more that people are, are in combat in situations where the ties to meaning are less clear, the more this is going to be a problem. And this is also, uh, you can take this into the interpersonal trauma realm, where somebody just comes up and beats somebody to death. And you happen to witness it. Or you're beaten close to death. You know, and for what? Your credit cards and a couple hundred bucks. How do you, how, how do you make sense of that? And, but we are meaning-seeking creatures. And one of the Parts, I believe, of our nature, if we really are to look at what we do, and one of the things that makes us different than other animals, is that we try to understand our experience. And to me, it's that collision of the incomprehensible with the need to understand that um, I believe is part of re-experiencing. Um, and what I, uh, the, uh, what I like to say is that to, a person comes to face with terrible knowledge. And the terrible knowledge is that aspect of the world that we didn't think was there. We couldn't imagine being there. And all of a sudden, we're faced with this. That other human beings can be enormously cruel and violent with each other. It's not something we grow up with most of the time. And even if you were, you know, a rowdy guy and, or gal and you like to watch combat movies or cop movies or things like that, once you're in combat, all the rules change. And trying to understand this creates a powerful dilemma, a powerful conflict within the self. Um, and also, it, it puts us face to face with the meaninglessness of evil. And we're, very, we're not well equipped, I think, to really understand that. And so 
I will often ask vets, you know, you think about this stuff, it comes up over and over again, you're trying to make sense of it. You've been in, Viet you know, you're, you're in Vietnam, what sense does this make to you? That your buddy was killed, or that you saw something flash in the bush and you turned and you hit, hit it with the 50 cal machine gun and it was a kid playing with a tin can. What sense does that make? Have you, what have you worked out? And almost always people say, I can't make any sense out of it. I said, it, could it be that it doesn't make sense? And oftentimes this is a very reassuring, it's a kind of an odd thing because, but can be oftentimes very reassuring because it in some ways, some, some deep and very existential ways does not make sense. And then we can talk about terrible knowledge and, the, uh, and the, the way in which we're changed by understanding, by not understanding, by coming face to face with uh, what I would call evil. Um, so let's think about avoidance. Why, what, what's the function of avoidance symptoms? This one I think is, uh, is pretty straightforward. We're animals. We animals avoid, try to avoid and escape painful experiences. That we're just built that way. That's what pain is. We attempt to avoid pain. And to me, if we understand that avoidance symptoms are really an attempt to avoid painful memories and uh, painful experiences, I think it gives us a very powerful understanding of the experience of that person, of what they're really going through. One of the things that I've learned from veterans over the years of when they are avoid ever talking about what was going on, uh, one guy, said to me a number of years ago, and I remember this clearly, he said, why would I ever want to talk to people about this? It's hard enough for me to have experienced this. I don't want to see the picture, them to see the pictures in my head. I don't want my wife to see these pictures. I don't want my kids to see these pictures. I don't want my friends to see these pictures. And so I don't talk about it. Because so many of these veterans are actually very people that are very highly into protection of others. Part of what made them good soldiers is what's also keeping them from sharing the experience. We know that avoidance symptoms, if not uh, dealt with, lead to longer, more pervasive course in PTSD. But in some ways, people have to find the appropriate place to talk about the terrible pictures. And if you're a young therapist, and you're getting ready to learn to do prolonged exposure therapy, it's going to be real important for you to have an understanding of what those pictures are really like. Because they're, they're really pretty horrific. I, I kind of always have thought it was a little bit of an older person's game to talk about trauma experiences. And that's why we have the dropout, right? I believe we have such a high dropout rate in prolonged exposure therapy, which is like about 45 or 50 percent. Because I think it actually overwhelms the therapist. Um, that's just a, a thought. The other thing that we want to understand is that in terms of numbing and detachment, one of the things I've learned from veterans is that I've learned not to get close because I don't then feel loss. If you're in combat, if you're sitting here in the room right now and all of a sudden a gunshot goes off, and the person that you're sitting next to is a friend that you've had, and that person has been killed. What's our natural human re reaction to that? What is the natural human reaction to this sudden loss? First of all, it's going to be shock, and then it's going to be grief. We are built to grieve the losses that we have. That's part of our mammalian uh, 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 wiring, is to grieve loss. If you're in combat and your buddy gets killed next to you, can you afford to grieve? Can you afford to be shocked? Can you afford to be unable to function? You can't. You have to keep going. You've got to pick up and keep going 
when in fact you've been faced with, in many cases, the most horrible thing you've ever experienced in your life. And so in combat veterans in particular have learned that you don't get close to other people so that you don't feel this. It's a shutting off of personal experience. And I believe it's a very important part of psychotherapy that's very difficult because what's important in a psychotherapeutic relationship or a, or a doctor-patient relationship is that you develop a sense of connection. Well, in terms of post-traumatic stress, that connection, that kind of helpful connection, uh, that attachment-oriented approach that we have that's, again, wired into us, is, I think, in some ways broken and it makes it quite difficult. So if we don't deal with the issue of needing to keep people at a distance so that you don't feel loss, then, then the therapy can get stalled quite easily. Is this? Okay. So let's think about negative alterations of experience and cognitions, the inability, you know, dissociative amnesia. Again, I believe that's, that, you know, that capacity that we have of pushing away things that are overwhelming to us. We all have it. I don't know if anybody's had the experience of breaking a, a leg or an arm and being out in the wilderness and having to come in four or five miles before you did that. I mean, you just have to, you can't, you can't have a broken leg and survive. You have to bring yourself across that. So we have this capacity to shut down um, and, and our, our memory of these sorts of things is a way to kind of get on with it. The other thing is that the way that I, I think we can think about the distorted beliefs and expectations, the I'm bad or the world is dangerous, is if we think about that is the terms of the world is dangerous, is that we're preparing for the worst having experienced suddenly and overwhelmingly outside of our control the worst, we want to gird ourselves for that kind of experience in the future. And I believe that people who have been severely traumatized brace themselves against the world because they know that that terrible knowledge and the, and the uh, meaningless of evil is out there in ways that other people don't know. Um, it's a way of protecting against future betrayal, betr trauma. And this goes all the way back to Freud, but I think it's they're, they're one of the things, one of the durable aspects of psychoanalysis or psychodynamic theory is that one of the control mechanisms that we use is that we take responsibility. We turn the anger against ourselves. I'm a bad person. If I hadn't done this, I hadn't done that, then this wouldn't have happened. It's, it's a cognitive control mechanism as opposed to a wrong cognition. A person is trying to control their experience by taking on the responsibility. And we'll see that again in another aspect. So the persistent distorted blame of self or others, um, again, to me, if we blame ourselves or blame somebody else, what we do is we deflect the utter helplessness of the trauma experience. One of the things about traumatic exposure is that it leaves us feeling overwhelmingly helpless. And quite frankly, as human beings, we don't do helplessness well. We're, again, we're problem-solving, uh, meaning-seeking creatures who are trying to get a, 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 along in a world that in some times is, is just oh, absolutely overwhelming. There was a very interesting study by, I don't know if people have ever read Ronnie Janoff Buhlman's book, it's a little bit old now, called Shattered Assumptions. And she did some very interesting research I just want to share with you. Um, she went around and studied uh, victims of pretty bad rape, um, uh, non-stranger uh, uh, rape. And she, wa she had the theory that people who blame themselves for it would have a longer course than people who didn't, who realized it was just something that happened to me. And when she did the research, she found that the people with the highest level of self-blame actually did the best. They had better recoveries than people who, who absolutely uh, didn't and just felt helpless to the environment. She, she actually even considered not publishing it. 
because it was because she's a feminist psychologist and it was just so uh, overwhelming. So she went back and looked at the nature of self-blame. And it, she found out that there were really two aspects of self-blame. One that she called characterological self-blame and the other she called behavioral self-blame. Characterological self-blame is there's something that's wrong with me as a person and the reason that I suffered the trauma is because there's something wrong with me. Folks like that had very long um, uh, courses, increased depression, increased suicidal behavior. People who engaged, engaged in behavioral self-blame ended up doing better. Behavioral self-blame said, gosh, if I had only, I mean, one example is a, a woman in a major city who was actually pretty good at self-protecting. She parked her car under a street lamp. She came up to the car. She felt it was safe. She came downtown by herself, came in, looks in the car, looks around, doesn't just jump in the car. So she did a real nice job of preparing. She gets in the car. As she's driving along, a guy in complete black comes up from behind the wheel well and accosts her, takes her to a remote area and rapes her. And she couldn't get over the fact that she hadn't been more careful. And the therapeutic intervention with this person was to make sure she had a flashlight on her keychain so that she could then take that next step of putting, looking in the flashlight into the wheel well. Because this, this had been a very successful um, a serial rapist who had really thought through um, how to go about um, his business. And he dressed in black, and he knew that people didn't look into that shadow of the wheel well, and you couldn't really distinguish it. And the thing that helped her was to, was to help her look, say, look, you're just, you're blaming yourself because you're looking for ways to do it better and to be safer. And so let's figure out ways to be safer and to do it better. And so um, in, in some ways, the uh, self-blame can be a preparatory uh, recognition of dangerous situations. You know, what can you do more to make yourself safe? And then blame of others is, to me, a kind of, it, it's really interesting. If you are, um, very, very deeply into blaming others, you remain attached to the persecuting figure. And that kind of attachment is an interesting one, which is one in which that person, the, uh, the perpetrator, takes a disproportionate um, role in your life. And to me, I would see, see that from a psychodynamic perspective, with identification with the aggressor and an attachment to a more powerful, though persecutory, other. Those of you who are thinking psychodynamically, you might want to think about that. So persistent emotions, such as fear, horror, anger, shame, or guilt, to me, in part, are the natural human experiences in facing evil. I worry that people don't have those experiences when thinking about the evil that we do to each other. The other thing is if somebody is horrified about what happened, and I'll tell you a little vignette here. I had a guy that I was seeing, um, he was in, in his 60s, he was in Vietnam, and this guy had worked his, had come back from Vietnam, had been drafted, he was a good soldier, came back, but he had had an ex traumatic experience that he could not get past. He just couldn't get past it. And people said, well, you know, you need to forgive yourself. You need to, you know, this is war and things like that. It only made him feel worse. So that was the, the time he was driving down the road. He was a young man. He was on manning a 50 caliber machine gun. He saw a flash in the bush. He turned his machine gun on to that opened up, and he saw a 10-year-old Vietnamese kid, basically 
hit by the machine gun. A 50 caliber machine gun bullet is about like that. The protocol in that situation is you do not stop. You're not allowed to stop because it could be a dangerous situation. So he drove on. He never knew whether that kid, that flash, was a gun or was a tin can. He, when he worked back in his memories, he kind of saw that it probably was a tin can. And he could not stop feeling this overwhelming, remitting sense of guilt and shame. And nothing that anybody told him made any difference. And he, as he became older and he couldn't work as much and he was sicker, he became very suicidal. And one of the interventions that I uh, did with this guy is I looked at him and I said, I'll get, you know, this is an overwhelming experience. You feel terrible. You've never been able to forgive yourself. It's a horrible thing. And do you, know, you understand that there is one thing worse than what your feeling is, what you're feeling. And he said, no, there's nothing worse. I said, that's not true. The, one, the thing that's worse is if you didn't feel this. If you didn't feel this sense of guilt. If you didn't carry the knowledge with you of what people could do to one another. And he, this, he was, uh, for the first time in his treatment, he was able to weep openly and recognize that what he was doing in his memory about this is that he was holding the memory of this child and the uselessness of this child's murder with him and that he had really been able to preserve his moral response as a human being. Okay, so um, when we think about diminished interest, to me this is decreasing exposure to possible dangerous situations or to being dangerous. I mean, a lot of Vietnam veterans are not only worried about being hurt, but in many instances worrying about hurting people where they get triggered and then all of a sudden the next thing they know they've hurt somebody very badly because they flipped into a survival mode. And also, um, what, one of the things we realize that when people pull back is that they really have lost a sense of meaning in life. And the things that they've enjoyed are no longer enjoyable. They often feel that they're not worth enjoying things in life because of what they've experienced. And so this is, this is often the, the un, understanding hyperarousal symptoms with Vietnam veterans or, or Iraqi veterans is, I think, a very straightforward thing. Hyperarousal symptoms in the, in the DSM-5 and DSM-4 are really about staying alive. So what I say to veterans is, okay, they told you you're hypervigilant. Is that right? Yeah. How important was it for you to be hypervigilant when you were walking the streets in Fallujah, when you're going through a ville, or you're walking the bush? How critical is it for you to stay alert? Is there any time when you're in country in places like this that you can let your alertness down? And the answer is no. So somebody who can remain alert in a dangerous situation that's highly dangerous is a person who has an increased level of, of uh, uh, decreases their risk of not surviving, increases their risk of surviving. People who are very, very hypervigilant and who are very sensitive, maybe even neurologically superior in their makeup, have an increased ability to stay alive. So hypervigilance is an enormously adaptive aspect of being human. And you know, that doesn't go away when you come out of combat. You know, once, once you've opened the door, the door doesn't get shut again. You're always going to be hypervigilant. You may be able to be less hypervigilant. You may be able to scan in, in a quick way and be more confident with it. But you will always, once the door to danger has been opened up in the way that a lot of our veterans and a lot of our trauma victims have done, 
you don't, you can't unring the bell. Irritability, snap irritability has enormous value in a dangerous situation in combat. It's the ability to go from being at rest or to going to, what I like to say to the, particularly Vietnam veterans, to go to full tilt boogie in an instant. You don't sit there and say, there's a guy with black pajamas running at me with a gun, I better shoot him. Because it's too late. That kind of training that a lot of our veterans get is that when they, then when they sense a situation that's dangerous, they're responding well before they're cognitively aware that they're responding. In other words, if the signal, danger signal comes in, hits the amygdala, we're going to be moving into that behavior to protect ourselves about a half a second before we realize what we're doing if we're well trained. And so sometimes people will find themselves talking with somebody and somebody walks up behind them, puts their hand on their shoulder, and they're like this before they're even aware of it. And a lot, there's a lot of guilt that veterans feel about that kind of uh, alertness to danger, that readiness to fight or flight, but I like to help them think about, well, maybe one of the reasons that you're sitting here with me today is because you were more alert and you were able to go and become aggressive more quickly. And, and so startle reactions become, I mean, I, I don't know if you've worked with vets where they, there's been a loud noise, they've come back from Vietnam and, or Iraq and Afghanistan, there's a loud noise and they're on the ground. And they're on the ground before they realize they're on the ground. Now how adaptive is that behavior in combat? It's a really adaptive behavior. If you're standing there going, I wonder what that is, it's probably going to be a little bit too late. And so rather than having a symptom of startle reaction, we can help them reframe it and think about it as you could learn to get out of the way. You know, used to when you were before you went in the military, you came up to the house and you heard a, something rustling in the wood in the, in the bushes, you'd look down and you'd say, oh, there's the cat. In Vietnam, you, just, you don't assume it's a cat. You're assuming somebody's going to try to kill you and you're going to get out of the way. I like to help people think about sleep disorder as sleeping with one ear open. And if you talk with veterans about their sleep patterns, what you realize is that they never let their vigilance go. That even with medication and things like that, if there's a noise, an unfamiliar noise in the house, they're going to be alert to it. Because they've been programmed, they've spent a year in a place where noises could mean I die. And so learning about sleeping with one ear open, and this is really very helpful to sort of in, encourage people to have dogs with better hearing than we have that are yappy. I mean, it was, it's always a very nice thing to know that if you've got a dog and the dog hears something before you do, then that can be your safety bud. Veterans always talk about, and trauma victims talk about, concentration problems. Well, concentration problems can be from intrusive memories because all of a sudden something's triggered them, but there's a very adaptive quality to concentration problems. When you're walking in a jungle or where you're walking in the streets of an Iraqi town, are you going to focus on what's ahead of you? Or is your focus going to be very, very broad? Should you be able, should you be able to play a video game when you're walking through there? No, you shouldn't, be able to be, you shouldn't be able to fiddle with something or just pay attention to the road in front of you. You want your attention and your concentration out here. How, I don't know if any of uh, folks here are hunters, but when you go out and you hunt, you don't walk along the trail. Your focus is very, very broad. And when you see a movement here or here or here, this is when you turn and hyper-focus. Hunting is... Broad focus, hyper focus. 
And I like to point this out to veterans because oftentimes it helps them understand that their difficulty in bringing their attention in is a kind of adaptive way in which they've learned to survive in an overwhelming and dangerous situation. Okay, I think I'm going to uh, take a couple of questions here. Would you like to hear some cases? So I got what, about 10 minutes? Let me, let me walk through a case or two. I'm going to do the first case is the case of the Native American Marine who couldn't stop fighting. I don't know if people are into uh, the psychometrics of uh, assessment of uh, trauma, but that's a pretty high PCLM score. That's a very high Mississippi score. Somebody that has a clinician administered PTSD scale score of 80 in the old thing is somebody has got very bad psychological trauma. So this guy was, um, came in, he was unable to sleep because of insomnia and terrifying nightmares and battles in Iraq. He would wake up in sweat and full panic and the thing that would wake him up was that all of a sudden he would be having a very vivid nightmare of a dangerous um, uh, situation. And he, he would be fully um, aroused, um, hyper, uh, hyper aroused when he woke up. Um, he had uh, intrusive memories with full flashbacks and a lot of things could trigger him and then he would lose, he would have that kind of dissociative response. Um, he uh, was very irritable, hypervigilant, and dissociated uh, experiences. This guy would go, he would just kind of barely make it through the week. He worked in a very hard, heavy labor job. He would come in on the weekends, he'd be exhausted, he hadn't sl couldn't sleep, and, he, and he, he just didn't know what to do with himself, so he'd go to a bar, get drunk, and fight. And that, he was, he was really good at fighting. And that would be one of the ways, he, and he would get into fights without really kind of realizing it. He didn't even recognize this pattern that much. But one of the things that we found out was that after he finished fighting, he could sleep a little bit better. The alcohol and the release, the kind of uh, release of uh, adrenaline and that sort of thing. Um, he was very detached um, and he was constantly agitated and exhausted. So does this guy meet PTSD criteria? DSM criteria? Could we take somebody who was a checkout person at 7-Eleven, give them 30 minutes of training and be able to diagnose this guy? Absolutely. It's not rocket science to diagnose this guy. The question really becomes, what do we do, how do we enter this guy's trauma narrative in a way that he's not so befuddled and not so overwhelmed by the kinds of experiences that he's having? Well, it turned out, as we got to know him, he was a member of a Native American tribe that was very, uh, where that a, a famous uh, U.S. general called the greatest cavalry fighters in history. And the guy was a historian, he included Genghis Khan in that. Um, and that this guy came with a, a family of tribe leaders and, and really great warriors. Um, uh, his, his forebears fought at Little Bighorn. Um, which, by the way, I don't know if people knew that Custer was on his way to basically continue the genocide of the American Indian. So that's why there was a, a lot of interest in Custer, because he was an Indian killer. Um, and that one of the things I found out about him is that he had not done the tribal rituals. He was a younger man, and that within this particular tribe, there was a long-standing, many hundreds of years rituals that when you go to war, you put on different clothes, you put on war paint, you go through a ritual, and then you go to war. And then when you came back, you can't let a warrior come back into the community without some kind of transition or cleansing because that person is primed to fight. And so what we tried to, what I said to him is that 
you know, and I went through the, the uh, what I call PTSD for people, talked about the, tr the hyper arousal response and that sort of thing and got him connected. I said, you know, it seems to me that what's happened here is that your warrior energy has been turned on and you haven't figured out a way to turn it off. And so we worked with him on the importance of rituals and how actually uh, the, our military and particularly in Vietnam, but, but that we don't maybe do that great a job in bringing people back into the community where they have to live in a different way. And so he, this guy actually went ahead and engaged in some of those um, rituals and he was able to calm that energy down, decrease his alcohol use. He was able to finally agree to take medication. He was terrified of taking medication. Anybody thought, anybody sense about why he wouldn't want to take medication that would lower his hyperarousal down? Lass of control. A lot of these guys, he said, like, you know, I'm not going to be, if I take the medication, I'm not going to be real, able to protect myself or protect my family. And so, again, in the context, once he was able to lower some of that, and, you know, we, uh, one of the things that we worked with him on was, you know, you can take an SSRI, it's not going to take your teeth away. Maybe give you a little bit more discernment about whether, when to turn it on or not. And you shouldn't really worry about it because you're a great warrior to begin with. I mean, this is a guy with multiply, um, there's a combat action ribbon, uh, Purple Heart. This is a very decorated guy who'd been in, I think, two tours in very hot areas. So, uh, anyway, how are we doing? Okay, I, I think what I'll do is uh, stop there because we, we end up in a few minutes and see if anybody has a, a question that I could address. All the way in the back, can please speak loudly, because I... Um, I think it's wonderful to have the question from the American side. Thank you, but I would like to know how did you um, or what were the relevant things that you did in the Absolutely, that's a great question. Right. So the question was, what's the role of medication in this? If we think, if we think from, if we shift from a disorder that needs to be medicated, I've got diabetes, I ought to take metformin, as a simple translation, and we think about medication as an adjunctive, as a way of assisting the person to deal with these problems that have been redefined, not so much as a disorder, but as their normal way of adapting, then I believe that their people are more willing to take medicine and are going to be more compliant because we're meaning-seeking creatures. This is all about a kind of a violation of our meaning. And so, for instance, with this veteran, the meaning for him of taking medication, and he really needed to be on an SSRI and probably a mood regulator, at least, and maybe, I mean, he, this, is guy, this guy screamed out cocktail to me, but he wasn't going to take any of it because his meaning, his sense of meaning, was that I'm going to lose control. If we can enter into his trauma narrative in such a way to help him understand what he's experiencing, then all of a sudden he can realize that you know, instead of the alcohol, instead of fighting until I'm exhausted, there we, we can help you chemically achieve those things on a more durable basis by doing this. It's not going to stop you from being able to fight if you need to. Is that, is that helpful? So the, uh, another way of saying is, let's contextualize the medication into the over, overall meaning system of the individual. Let's start with the person and then move the disorder in as an aspect of the person as opposed to the other way around. I, I believe that.
Right. Right, and so you get a little bit better. I mean, you you can use your you can use your palette. You you have more colors to to paint with. Right. Oh, well, and, and, but PTSD is a disorder. You know, people, I, I, I'm going to say something that's actually uh, a little um, out of the box. I don't see PTSD as a cognitive disorder. I see it as a disorder of the body. Because what we're, another way to think about it is the neuropsychology of attachment, that kind of you know, the disruption is going to be in the, in the neurobiology of our connectedness to other human beings. And, the, and then, of course, all the fear responses and things like that. So you've got a huge kind of thing. And simply giving people, I mean, cognitive things can be enormously helpful. But for some people, for this guy sitting down and doing prolonged exposure therapy or cognitive processing therapy is kind of like, it's just not not going to do it. Does this guy need medication? This guy this guy bad need a medication. Is he going to take it unless we contextualize it? Absolutely not. And what you're talking about is a, a kind of more sophisticated understanding of the neurotransmitters based on an understanding of the symptoms, so that we're targeting neurologic bio, you know neurobiological processes in a in a much more precise way. I think it's a fabulous idea. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Well, that, you're, you're singing my song. Okay, I, I really believe that as well. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a huge believer in, I mean, I, I go back to when we were working with people in the hospital and we had basically phenothiazines and tricyclic antidepressants. And you're, you're talking, and, but today we have medications that really are, can really focus and do things in ways we can. But if we don't understand, and this is across disorders, that, that people have meaning. And that they, yeah, go ahead.
Well, I, mean, I, 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 have a, have, I have some thought about that. If in, fact, if, in fact, what we're doing is we're opening up the attachment system, psychotherapy is an attachment-focused intervention, and that what we're doing is in the, in the same way that mothers and fathers regulate babies interpersonally, that has a very profound, and if you don't do that, that also has a profound uh, neurobiological consequence. To me, we, we can't make those distinctions so much anymore with the, the new neurobiology that's coming out. You just can't. And, uh, but let me just say one, one thing is kind of where I got this. I, uh, I always was, in, my father was a pharmacist, so I was always interested in medications. Yeah, I'm a psychologist. And I got my, I was able to talk my way into a, a, a weekend workshop with a fellow named Frederick Goodwin, who you may know of as uh, kind of the father of uh, the study of mood disorders. And, uh, you know, he was, you know, he let me in. He said, you know, you can't practice. I know I can't practice it, but I, I want to know about this. And one of the things he said to me that always stuck with me is that he said, you know, I'm, when you're working with somebody with bipolar disorder, the medications do this, but it doesn't repair the person's loss of self-esteem, and it doesn't repair their relationship difficulties. And so his belief was that you always had somebody in psychotherapy when you were treating them with bipolar disorder. And Fred himself was a psychodynamic, a lot of people don't know this, he's a psychodynamically trained therapist who was a really good therapist from, from D.C. I mean, he was somebody that would, you'd really like to go see whether you used the meds or not. So I think they could probably, people can stay as long as they want, Tom. And, and you want me to do this in a paragraph? <laughs> this is a book. Thank you. No. Um, I'm, I believe if we think about psychotherapy broader than psychotherapy, if we think about it as humans helping other humans repair, if reconnecting, people who have psychological trauma are disconnected from the interpersonal world. They're disconnected from their community. They're often disconnected from themselves. So beginning to work on reconnecting, whether we're doing it as a psychiatrist, in the way that we talk about medications, and the way that we present them, and how that can help them, and showing them how that affects the particular symptoms, or whether we're doing it as a nurse on the ward, helping somebody that's isolated, or whether we're doing it in a formal psychotherapy setting, we ought to be thinking about this person's disconnection from the community right off the bat. And so all of these interventions, interpersonal interventions, should be occurring at all levels. Absolutely, thank you. Favorite topic of mine, and one I have some pretty big arguments with in terms of um, prolonged exposure therapy. If we go back to Judy Herman's fabulous book called Trauma and Recovery, if, you haven't, if you're interested in uh, psychological trauma and treatment and understanding, it's my absolutely favorite book next, well, and then Bessel van der Kolk's work. The first thing that we do in treatment is not have that person relive. What we try to do is to get that person regulated. Because if, in fact, we enter into the re-experiencing, before a person has developed regulatory capacity, all we're doing is re-traumatizing them. I mean, if, if, in fact, a person's, you know, neurophysiology gets jacked up and overwhelmed by having these memories, by addressing these memories right off the bat, are we really, is the re-experiencing going to work? And I would argue the more severe the trauma, the less likely it's going to work. 
And that's where we need both the sort of the psychosocial and the psychobiological methods of regulating. There's a new evidence-based treatment coming out of the National Center for PTSD that's called a STAIRS narrative th therapy, and it's a model that was, has been used with female trauma victims. Um, and the whole first part of treatment, and this is Herman as well, is a kind of teaching a person to regulate overwhelming emotions and then beginning to very gently enter into re-experiencing peace. I also believe that some people don't, aren't able to, to do the re-experiencing piece. I just had, I, have, I don't like saying that, but I've had people that really couldn't, couldn't do it. But if we help them regulate, you know, and, and look, DBT is fabulous in this way. Di dialectical behavioral therapy, it's a great toolkit of regulations. So. I would say the first thing we want to do is help a person be able to regulate, and we have a lot, of, a lot of ways to do that, and then at their speed begin to see if we can enter into the traumatic experience and the brokenness of meaning that occurs around that. Is that helpful? Okay. Short answer is no. We do know that people, the research, psychotherapy research indicates that people, more people who are in the trauma numbing and the broken meaning area of adaptation have longer treatment courses and less good outcomes. So if you're numbed down and disconnected, then you pay a price for that. But it may be a price worth paying. But I think we enter into the exposure of people to trauma at our own peril. We need not to go at our pace. We not, need not to go at the pace that our theories, our modern theories tell us, but really at the pace in which that, I mean, that's part of being a good therapist, a good physician, is understanding where your client is and beginning to titrate in treatment intervention at their pace. Right, yeah, because we are more complex than, than the nosologies that we have to... We, we do so at our peril. Yes, sir. Um, to me, I step back, I'm a little less interested in the particular disorder and a little more interested in the processes underlying the disorder. So one of the ways that I would say this, and it kind of ties to a, lot, a number of the things around, is that these are processes that occur across diagnostic categories.
Absolutely. And another way of saying that, and I, I agree with that, is somebody who is holding, uh, whose grief is unresolved, has got something that they're having trouble thinking about or tr experiencing, and the, the, the loss of an attachment figure has a more profound or maybe even more complex picture. So it could be that there's a lot of anger associated with that person that has never been, and then there's guilt about experiencing, you know, the loss of a, of a traumatizing parent. Well, I, I mean, anything that moves us from a discontinuity model to a we're simply more human than not model, a continuity model, in my mind, breaks down, moves through the, the tendency that we have as human beings to categorize. And I think it's, it's largely to the good. Look, you know, each has its own important role. I mean, the, the, uh, what we see in the DSM for PTSD is the... It's, it's one of those areas like uh, mood disorders and depressive disorders, but there's been an enormous amount of research. And all of a sudden we get pictures of how people function a lot better. And, and uh, so many of these criteria have great research bases, but research it's by its nature is pulling out a little piece and focusing on the risk factors and the degree to which it contributes and things like that. Um, and then we have to kind of take that good stuff and then reintegrate it with a whole view of the person. So I, I, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that I think we're singing the same song here. Okay. Well, because you, yeah, because you nearly killed yourself. You didn't nearly die. You nearly killed yourself. You already have a distortion of meaning that you're struggling with. No, I know. So you weren't trying to kill yourself, right? Absolutely, because you're because it helped regulate the anxiety and the terror that you felt of, oh my gosh, one of the things that happened to me is I lost consciousness. Next thing I know, they're pulling me out of a, a truck at the bottom of a ravine. That's a, that's a very scary experience, particularly for those of us who are, I mean, I'm a major control freak. So, I mean, you know, we don't get to do what we do without, you know, really exerting enormous amount of control. That's got to be an overwhelming, terrifying experience. And I love the fact that somebody did something simple like regulate your heartbeat. So that it, it's, hard to be, it's hard to have a lot of anxiety and having regular heartbeat. Isn't that kind of the way that Prazosin works? You know, it's a kind of, you don't wake up because your heartbeat's regulated. It's hard to have those dreams break through. So thank you for sharing that. I'm glad you recovered. Okay, thank you very much for your time.